This is the second week of maybe a four or five month series on the Sermon on the Mount. Last week, I tried to kind of reiterate, I think not, uh, I wasn't very happy with how I it reiterated it, but I tried to say that basically how one understands the Sermon on the Mount very much has to do with the context within which one tries to read the sermon and follow the sermon. And when you look at Matthew chapter 4, you see that Jesus places this sermon in a very particular context. He has first announced that the kingdom of God is present, is at hand, is breaking into the world. Heaven is invading earth. The future is crashing into the present. And then he goes up to a series of kind of ragtag people and says, I want you to be my disciples. Come follow me. So you get this, the kingdom is breaking into the world, this call to discipleship. And then he embarks on this kind of Galilean ministry, this peripatetic ministry of preaching and teaching and healing, Matthew tells us. And it's only in the presence of this kingdom, this call to discipleship and this healing ministry that Jesus then sits his disciples down and teaches them the Sermon on the Mount. Now, I think the significance of this context is that the Sermon on the Mount is meant to be read as a description of what human life and relationships and community look like when the kingdom of God breaks into the world. That's what the Sermon on the Mount is about. When it's taken outside of this context, then the Sermon on the Mount becomes, I think, either like frustrating idealism or oppressive moralism. But when it's seen in the context of the kingdom of God breaking into the world, the Sermon on the Mount brings us good news of what redeemed human life looks like. And we also talked about last week how it's really interesting that Jesus starts the sermon with these eight Beatitudes. It's as if he says, redeemed human life begins with the heart. It begins with transformed character. And it's only that as we as people have our character and our hearts transformed, that we will actually have the humility and the ability by God's grace to then live out what Jesus talks about in the rest of the sermon. And so Jesus begins with the Beatitudes, and that is where we are at today. Last week, we looked at the Beatitude on poverty of spirit. And this week, we're going to look at the next three Beatitudes, the Beatitude on mourning, Beatitude on meekness, and the Beatitude on hungering and thirsting for righteousness. So, so the first beatitude for the day is on mourning. Verse four, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. So G this is kind of a paradoxical sort of thing. <laughs> Jesus is saying, when the kingdom of God breaks into your life or the life of your community, there's going to be mourning and there's going to be grief and there's going to be sorrow. It's one of the paradoxes of the gospel. Somehow good news brings great sadness. And I think the key is understanding that this sadness has to do with us realizing just how far we and the world in which we live have fallen from the good flourishing design that God had for us. Blessed are those who mourn. Now, the word that Jesus uses here is like the, the strongest possible Greek word for sorrow and grief. It speaks not just of kind of a melancholy, you're having a blue day, it's a bit cloudy outside sort of thing. This sorrow speaks of the piercing pain that leads to uncontrollable tears. So in the ancient world, this word was often used to describe that a, the pain that a parent would feel when their child died unexpectedly. It's the kind of grief which takes such a hold that it cannot possibly be hidden. So I think one of the images that comes to my mind is Jesus like weeping uncontrollably at the tomb of Lazarus, just overcome with grief. So one of the things that this tells us right away at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount is that the Christian life, according to Jesus, the, the kingdom living, according to Jesus, is not all joy and laughter. There is an appropriate sorrow um, there's an appropriate sense of Christian tears that should be said, should be shed. Now, I think key to understanding this is that I don't think Jesus is just talking about a general human experience of sorrow. And the reason for that is that the context here is that this is a sorrow that is birthed by the kingdom of God breaking in. I think what Jesus is talking about is 
as he said, is that when you catch a taste of the kingdom of God, when you get a, a glimpse of Jesus' vision for human flourishing and for human life in the world, then you will look at the brokenness and suffering of the world, and you will look at the brokenness and sin of your own life, and you, you will grieve it. You will lament the ways we fall short. You will look around at the world and say, this is not the way it's supposed to be. Like, it doesn't have to be this way. I mean, I just think off the top of my head, are, of, are, we, to, are we right as Christians to mourn the gr when the greed of some leads to like the, the, the scarcity of others? Yes. Are we right as Christians to mourn when, when God's like good design for human relationships and sexuality is not seen as a gift? Yes. Are we right to mourn when people feel marginalized because of the color of their skin? Yes. Are we right to mourn when human, human life is like valued on a sliding scale because it's based on age and capacity? Yes. Like, I think what Jesus is saying to us is that the Christian response to, like, sin and brokenness of the world is not shouting, it's not blaming, it's not shaming, it's not labeling, it's not name-calling, and it's not dismissing. Christians mourn when they see the brokenness and sin of the world. They weep with those who weep, and they grieve and they lament as those who are really well acquainted with the fact that they themselves are broken and sinful. I think it's one of the reasons why I love the Anglican kind of confessional tradition. Our Anglican liturgy invites us every single day to, to acknowledge and lament our many sins and offenses. So I think this is what Jesus is saying to us in this first beatitude here. Blessed are those whose hearts are broken for the world's suffering, and whose hearts are broken for their own sin, for they will be comforted. I don't know about you, but I've actually found this beatitude to be really helpful in my life in the midst of this season. <laughs> uh, shedding tears in this season may not mean your soul is in a bad place it may actually mean that your soul is in sync with the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. But I think it's really important that Jesus says there's comfort that God brings to those who are mourning this brokenness. Because we need a corresponding comfort to carry us through the sadness that we feel. Otherwise, we'll just find ourselves giving in to the madness. Like we, we need God to comfort us in the midst of it. And so he says, Jesus says, blessed are those of you who mourn, who know that human life can be so much more than this. Yet it is precisely you who will know the comfort of God in the difficulty. So that's the beatitude of mourning. And then Jesus goes on to the beatitude of meekness. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Jesus is saying when the kingdom of God lays hold of a person's life and begins to transform a person, they become meek. They become gentle. Now, I think gentleness could potentially be described as, as that quality of human character which is found at the intersection of conviction and empathy. That quality of human character which is found at the intersection of conviction and empathy. Gentleness does not mean no conviction, no cause, no courage, no brain, no bronze, no backbone. Gentleness is not spinelessness. And I think the, the reason we see this is that in the Bible, the only two people who are ever described as meek and gentle are Moses and Jesus. And those are hardly kind of milk toast, like pushover sort of people, I don't think. Moses and Jesus are the gentle, the paradigm of gentleness in the Bible. I think helpful in this regard is that understanding that in the ancient world, sometimes gentleness was defined in relation to how one controlled or expressed anger. So, for example, Aristotle himself defines gentleness as the mean, the middle place, 
between excessive anger on the one hand and inappropriate apathy on the other hand. So if one went that direction, they could translate Jesus' words as blessed are those who are always angry at the right time and never angry at the wrong time. It's this sense that gentleness knows that shouting louder and flexing harder is not the way of the kingdom of God. But gentleness also knows that remaining silent and settling for the status quo is also not the way of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God simultaneously uproots all apathy and tears down all pride. It's the intersection of conviction and empathy the intersection of conviction and empathy. I, while this character or virtue was often desired in the ancient world, in some respects, it, in some parts of the ancient world, it, it wasn't always seen as a good thing. Because <laughs> gentleness and meekness is, is not always a desirable quality in cultures where, where might is seen as right. And, and Jesus knew this. I think he understood this context. He lived in an age when Roman rule wielded its power in the name of law and order to make sure that no one disrupted the status quo. And he also lived in an age when revolutionary uprisings often sought to overthrow Roman, Roman authority and rule in order to kind of forge a new and better future. Jesus himself actually lived in the land of Galilee, where lots of these Jewish kind of revolts and, and uprisings happened. For the Roman authorities, the evil of the world was anarchy. And for the Jewish revolutionaries, the evil of the world was oppression. And Jesus was speaking directly into this context, this context that is fraught and divisive and, and tense. And he says, I want my followers to be marked by gentleness. I want them to be marked by the humility and the empathy that undergird gentleness. I don't know if Many of you probably the know the name J.I. Packer, and many of you have probably heard that at this point, by this point, that on Friday he he died at 93 years old. I had the privilege of of knowing Jim Packer personally when I lived in Canada. Um, we were members of the same church for about eight years, um, and I actually cut my teeth at preaching at the service that he attended. And so uh, after every time I would try it again, he'd come up to me after the service and give me some gracious but constructive feedback. <laughs> and um, what always amazed me about Jim Packer is not only his encyclopedic memory, like you have to be careful asking that guy a question because he will give you a 30 minute lecture in response to any question you give him. But what really hit me about Jim was his, his gentleness. I'll never forget being a part of kind of a question answer session for about two hours. And, and somebody asked him the question, like uh, one of the most complex theological questions one could ever conceive of. He said, how, how do we understand Jesus' cry of dereliction on the cross? Like that, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? How do we understand that in light of the life of the Holy Trinity, in light of the doctrine of the Trinity? Like, what's happening there if Jesus is crying out, why have you forsaken me? If there is this perfect eternal bliss and love between father and son, like, how does that work? And I can't think of a harder theological question, honestly. And Jim Packer, he went on for 20 minutes and he, he talked about what Augustine thought about it. He talked about what Calvin thought about it, what Schleiermacher thought about it, what Karl Barth thought about it. And, and he just waxed eloquent for 20 minutes. And then after 20 minutes, the moderator said, okay, well, it's probably time for you to go, Dr. Packer. Um, how can we pray for you? And it, it, I can't tell you what he said in 20 minutes about the theological question, but I remember what he responded to the prayer question perfectly. He said, my, my daughter's dog is sick and she needs to be put down tomorrow. And you know how hard it is for people that really love their dogs. So I really appreciate your prayer that God would comfort her tomorrow morning. And, and it just hit me. I realized that I was in the presence of a godly man 
he he could wax eloquent about the greatest of theological questions but when it came to when it came to how would you like me to pray he was praying for his daughter who was grieving over the eventual death of a dog and i thought to myself now he gets it that is the empathy that is the humility of a man who understands that gentleness and meekness is at the core of the kingdom of God. And I wonder, brothers and sisters, what it would look like for us in this season to exhibit that sort of gentleness, to exhibit that sort of meekness. Because Jesus says, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. And it's really interesting, that language, inherit the earth, comes directly from Psalm 37. And Psalm 37 is one of those psalms where David is looking at the world and he's asking the question, why does it seem like the prideful and the powerful and the grabbers and the getters are the ones who always win? And in Psalm 37, God says to David, he gives David words and he says, do not worry about the rich and the powerful and the evildoers. He says, because it's the meek and the gentle and the humble that are going to inherit the earth someday. And one of the astonishing things to me is that when you get to Revelation 22, it describes this picture of the new creation of us seeing the face of God. And then it gets this, this language that we often overlook of the church. And it says, and we will reign with him forever. In Revelation, it is picturing the gift that is given to those who are meek now in the midst of evildoers. The gift that is given to them is they get to inherit the whole world with the king. And they get to reign with Christ in the new creation. Blessed are the meek, says Jesus. Blessed are those who do not power grab now, for they will inherit the earth then. So Jesus says, when the kingdom of God breaks into my people's lives, it shows up as mourning over the brokenness of their lives in the world, and it shows up as meekness. And finally, he says it shows up as hungering and thirsting for righteousness. We see this in verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Now, many scholars argue that this language of righteousness is the central theme of the whole Sermon on the Mount. Like Jesus says just a few verses later, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, that's a scary thing to say. Um, we'll talk about that later in a few weeks. But it just goes to show that for Jesus, righteousness could possibly be the word that describes kingdom living in all of its wholeness most poignantly. Righteousness. Divine righteousness is a central theme throughout the Bible as well. Righteousness for God speaks of the inner integrity of his being that is expressed in faithfulness to his creation and his covenant people. And human righteousness mirrors this divine righteousness. It is like this inner moral integrity that expresses itself in relational fidelity and right relatedness in every sector and sphere of life. So a lot of kind of theologians of old say, in order to understand this righteousness, you actually have to go all the way back to Genesis chapter one and two, and you have to see what sorts of relationships did God create humanity for? Because righteousness is right relatedness in every one of those relationships. So if you go back to Genesis one and two, you see we're created for relationship with God. We're created for relationship with others. We're created with relationship to creation and we're created for relationship to self. And when Jesus talks about righteousness, he is talking about this holistic, expansive vision for human life, that all of its relationships are flourishing. I think the kind of British scholar, since I talked about J.A. Packer, and he is one of these British evangelicals, I might as well talk about John Stott, who is another one of these British evangelicals, and, and he describes biblical righteousness really well. He says biblical righteousness is more, it's not less, but it's more than private and personal 
affairs. It includes social righteousness as well. And, and he goes on to describe what social righteousness is. Stott says, we learn from the law and the prophets that righteousness is also concerned with seeking human liberation from oppression together with promotion of civil rights, justice in law courts, integrity in business dealings, honor in the home, and care and concern for family affairs. And he summarizes it this way. Christians are committed, says Jesus, to hungering for righteousness in the whole human community as something that is pleasing to a righteous God in the whole community, every facet of human life. That's why I like the quote that Tim Keller once said to be kind of provocative. He said, if we're really following Jesus in the kingdom way that's laid out in the Sermon on the Mount, then we'll need to be more conservative than the conservatives and we'll need to be more liberal than the liberals. Because righteousness is not something that can be contained into a particular set of agendas that, that we choose some relationships to focus on in the world and not others. Righteousness for Jesus is one of these holistic biblical terms that encompasses every aspect of our lives. And he says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness as if they cannot live without it. For it's them and them alone that will be satisfied. One of the questions that I think is presented to us by Jesus in this season is are we willing to have our hunger and thirst for righteousness expanded to encompass everything that Jesus' heart cares about? Are we willing to have our hunger and thirst for righteousness expanded to encompass everything that Jesus' heart cares about. When Jesus was beginning his public ministry, he went to John the Baptist in the Jordan River to be baptized. And, and John said, why should I baptize you? You should be baptizing me. It should be the other way around. And, and Jesus responds to him in the waters and he says, I must be baptized. This must happen in order that I might fulfill all righteousness. Right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, as he is baptized for, for public proclamation of the kingdom of God, he says, what am I on about in the world? I'm on about fulfilling all righteousness, bringing right relationship to every sphere and every sector of human life. And that's precisely what Jesus invites his people into today. He invites his people to seek this righteousness. Blessed are the poor in spirit, says Jesus, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Brothers and sisters, may it be so with us this week. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.